Thank you everyone for joining us today for Legal Talk, where we will be discussing one of my favourite subjects, responsible AI and ethics, what it means in practice. So thank you very much to Linda Prezidetsky for joining us today. Linda is an Associate Professor, Strategic AI at the Human Technology Institute, where she leads the Skills Lab. An experienced policymaker, researcher and advocate, she's passionate about helping key decision makers to address the most pressing challenges posed by emerging technologies. Linda has worked across government, academia, civil society and non-profit organisations and is passionate about ensuring that human values are embedded in AI systems across every sector. And I'm so glad to be talking to her today. At LexisNexis, I've got some pretty amazing colleagues who are working on things like deep learning, graph neural network, natural language understanding and natural language generation. But I think it's really important that we continue the conversation as both the technologies, our understanding of human rights and the outcomes that we see from that combination evolve. So Linda, why are we talking about ethics, which is such a human centered concept in a discussion on AI? So I think uh, ethics pose some of the most exciting conversations at the moment. Uh, the biggest and most interesting challenge for me is figuring out how to translate ethical principles into action. So there are currently hundreds of principles-based AI ethics frameworks all around the world. We have one uh, that was released by the Australian government uh, in 2019. The kind of values that they are promoting are human-centered values, fairness, contestability. But when we talk about ethics, some of the challenges are how do we actually operationalize this? And for example, if you were using an AI system to look at resumes to determine whether a job candidate was suitable or unsuitable, you'd really be asking, where do we draw the line? What is a fair process? What kind of feedback should we be providing those candidates? So ethics lead us to some really interesting discussions and very interesting questions, no matter which sector we, we're applying AI systems within. Yeah, I think those are all concepts that hopefully most people will be familiar with, things like fairness and transparency. And I think it's what do those challenges mean in this new world of AI that again, is a concept. I mean, how would you define AI itself? So when we're talking about artificial intelligence, it's not a term of art. It doesn't have a precise scientific meaning that's generally agreed upon uh, amongst experts or the broader community. So it tends to be more of a marketing term that refers to a broader cluster of technologies or techniques that allow uh, technologies to be used in ways that sometimes uh, surpass human intelligence. One useful definition is software that automatically makes predictions, makes decisions, gives advice using data analysis or statistics uh, and or self-learning logic. And increasingly, as we're moving into a world where generative AI is becoming the norm, it's also about technologies that can actually generate images and content and code uh, for us to create new products that we can use um, in our daily lives. I think that's really a really helpful um, definition. And I love the fact that you've said it's not a term of art. And in fact, I think you could also say that ethics itself is not a term of art. And in fact, for most of the audience, and certainly for me on the call today, thinking about the difference between legal protections and ethics, and maybe that leads us into a question about what responsible AI is and what that might mean for the future. Absolutely. So when we talk about responsible AI, I think it can be quite easy to grandstand and use all sorts of <laughs> fancy language to talk about uh, how we can use AI for good. That is important, but when we're being responsible, we need to know what we're actually trying to achieve and also what we're trying to avoid. So a good way to look at what we're trying to avoid is by thinking through three different categories. So the first is failure. So an AI system not doing what we want it to do. That could be security failures. That could be a system that isn't treating people fairly. 
it might not be working as intended or it might also be failing us when we need it most. So, for example, a medical AI system that's helping with surgery, what if it cuts out in the middle of the process? So it's ultimately a system that's failing the people who use it and the people who it's impacting. The second category is malicious deployment. Here we're talking about ill intent, things like cyber attacks, spreading misinformation, creating deep fakes, Uh, manipulating people, just to name a few examples. And lastly, the third category is overuse. So that could be an AI system that is not designed to function in a context in which it's deployed. Perhaps we're relying too heavily on technology when a human perspective is really what's needed. And it can also involve, uh, for example, environmental costs, such as the carbon costs of excessive use. So that's failure. And I guess you might be listening, thinking, well, what now? So to address those three categories of failure, ultimately what I like to tell people is that we need to focus on four things. We need to make AI that's fair, that's fit for purpose, that is accurate and accountable. And we have to remember that when we're talking about um responsible AI, we're not operating in a digital wild west. The law still applies. And when we're talking about responsibility, we do want to talk about ethics and we do want to talk about policies um, because sometimes they are a way for us to test out new approaches. They can also help us go beyond the law uh, in areas where the law is silent. But ultimately, we need to make sure that legal compliance is front and centre uh, and that is, not a, uh, that is not to be substituted by voluntary ethics guidelines. We need to make sure that we actually have standards that we're following to make sure that people are doing the right thing uh, and that the effects of AI are creating positive impacts in our society. Yeah, I think that's a really good point as well like a lot of the concepts that you're talking about obviously are enshrined in legislation like fairness for example and privacy and cyber are certainly hot topics whether it's because of technology or other aspects um, of the way we operate in our society how are you seeing um, the impact of extraterritorial or uh, laws that are coming from other jurisdictions whether it's AI laws in the EU or possibly examples in the US Yeah, absolutely. This is something that is really exciting to talk about right now. We've seen the GDPR, for example, as uh, EU regulation that has had a tremendous impact on how we do, uh, how, how we practice in Australia when it comes to AI and privacy and personal information. So with the, uh, recent review of the Privacy Act, we can see the GDPR having such a tangible impact in terms of the way we think about our laws in Australia. If you're a company that's operating in Australia and have an international presence, um, it's also really vital to think about things like uh, in the US, competition law is something that you need to be mindful of if you are uh, deploying your product uh, or um uh, offering your services within a US context. So because these technologies allow us to function uh, internationally, we can have uh, so many impacts in other jurisdictions, but we also need to be cognizant of the law uh, that we're facing when we're functioning in these different jurisdictions. And I also think that it can have some majorly positive effects because if some international laws do set a higher standard, it gets us thinking, uh, how do we lift our own compliance and our own standards when it comes to um, our own company policies. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really interesting way to look at it. Um, it's such a new and emerging area, although as we've agreed with a basis in existing laws. So looking for examples of what's working and what's not throughout the world really, really makes sense. Um, Let's move away from this law nerd stuff, which honestly I could I could talk about a lot more. Let's get into the good stuff. Like what are the dilemmas here? What are the trade-offs we have to make? What are the examples of where things are now working well and maybe are giving us some lessons of what not to do? So before we really get into the weeds there, I think it's important to acknowledge that when we're talking about ethical 
dilemmas we're we're talking about harms so mm. tangible negative impact these can be simple inconveniences such as something not going into your spam folder when it really should have or it can be really serious consequences such as unlawful discrimination or loss of life so when we're talking about AI, I like to remind people that some of these harms can be created by the technology and others can be exacerbated or scaled by the technology. So an example of something that might be created by AI is an autonomous weapon, something that we didn't have before, whereas a harm that can be exacerbated by technology might be an algorithm that's trained on biased decisions being rolled out all across a company. So when we're thinking about the trade-offs, some of them, I guess, have very, very serious consequences. And I just wanted to put that into perspective. Yeah. Some of the ones that um, I come across a lot are in essential services markets. So for example, if we think about a bank that realizes customers are, that are experiencing financial hardship might also be the most profitable. Would it be right to target them with unsuitable products? Absolutely not. So the trade-off there is you might not be able to get the maximum product in order to do the right thing. Uh, when it comes to, for example, generative AI, we're getting some interesting kinds of trade-offs as well. We're getting a technology that's very fluent, but sometimes leaves us wanting more in terms of reliability. The same thing can happen, for example, if we're looking at uh, any biometric or facial recognition uh, AI uses. We might be trading, uh, making a trade-off between privacy and accuracy. So we're really talking about what do we want to prioritise and what values do we want to put forward? And those um, ultimately are very important conversations to be having every day. Um, AI systems are not a set and forget. Uh, it can't be it can't be approached in that way. You need to constantly interrogate what ch choices are you making and why are you making them? And do they still um, do they still suit the values that your organization um, is prioritizing? And I would like to pick up on that. I think we are increasingly aware of those different harms, um, whether it's generally in society or to particular vulnerable groups. But that example that you gave in financial services where you're making decisions about getting a product into market, I think there are, are positives as well, which is where the responsibility and responsible innovation comes in that possibly in the past using an existing data set might tell you, for example, not to loan money to, um, say, a woman who's been on maternity leave because she hasn't had a consistent pay over the last 12 months, but actually you're missing out on a long-term customer there. So I think it's really important that in these trade-offs, we're also looking at, at the positives and the negatives. But I'd really like to work with you on an area that I think you're an emerging leader in, which is the rental platforms. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on how that um, is working in both terms of harms and positives and, and how people using that kind of technology, the kind of issues they should be considering. Absolutely. So thank you um, so much for bringing this up. It's an area I'm really passionate about. So my research focuses on the use of automated decision making in determining access to uh, rental housing. Essentially, I'm looking at how people's data is assessed, uh, so how they're scored, rated and ranked in order to inform whether or not uh, they are a competitive applicant for rental housing. Now, in this area, I firstly want to acknowledge that technology can be absolutely be part of the solution. So we already have a lot of discrimination in the rental housing market that's well documented. You don't need technology to, um, to, to bring discrimination uh, into the picture because it's already there. I'm very concerned about technology scaling and making more opaque some of the discrimination and unfair treatment that's happening. So what I'm interested in is figuring out what kind of harms are occurring, why they're occurring, and putting in appropriate regulation to ensure that people accessing rental housing are protected. So some of the worst examples I've seen have been apps in the North American market that look at people's data, including their social media profiles, 
and claim to be able to predict uh, their neighborliness, their reliability, their likelihood to pay rent, uh, their willingness to pay rent, their eviction potential. So these apps claim to use artificial intelligence, but what they're really doing is spitting out a number. We don't know uh, how accurate this number is, what it's based on. And frankly, I don't think that it's particularly fair to be using someone's social media profile to determine whether or not they are going to be a good neighbor. So ultimately, um, these products shouldn't be in market, but they are. And the people who are using them, so uh, particularly real estate agents who are using them in their assessments, don't necessarily know uh, how to think about them critically because these products promise the world, but really they could be harming the renters uh, that are trying so hard in competitive property markets to put their best foot forward. And um, we really shouldn't be allowing these technologies to uh, be involved in these decisions if uh, we're not certain that they are fair and legal. Yeah. And I, yeah, that, uh, that I think should be a concern generally in our society is that we're using tools that we don't understand um, and taking what now seems to be a positive outcome, more efficient processes, but actually might have really serious impacts, not only on individuals, but flow and effects that we, we can't really see at this time. Um, another example of that, I think, that comes up in the, the court systems is previously decision-making tools that we used. Um, and I'm really interested in your thoughts on what's happened in the past, but also how AI might be now being applied to litigation solutions like e-discovery and evidence. Absolutely. I think it's quite exciting that we're seeing uh, law, uh, law being influenced by AI technologies that can really provide a range of benefits. Uh, we've seen tools that help with document processing and review, drafting, highlighting anomalies, tools that are used in discovery for litigation purposes. But some remember, they're not perfect. Some really silly things can trip these systems up. So I've heard of uh, anecdotal evidence where these systems t get totally confused by clauses that are spread across two pages and won't read that clause as one. So it's where the human when, wins, though, Linda. That's the, where our, <laughs> our point of exactly. difference Exactly. So we're seeing these, you know, clauses incorrectly identified as high risk as well, just because they contain the word indemnity. Um, and we have to be mindful of, to which extent we rely on them. So something that we mentioned before around people um, placing a greater value on some of these technological tools, it's important to bring up a, con a concept called tech technological deference, where we essentially defer, we place greater value on technology just because it looks so impressive and shiny. Um, you might have also heard it called the lab coat effect, where you have an expert come in uh, who you don't necessarily know how they've drawn their conclusions, but because they are deemed an expert, you place such a high value on what they're saying. So it's important when we're using these legal tools to understand how they work, how reliable they are, and really think through whether it's appropriate to be using them when they're informing very consequential things. So particularly in the courtroom, when we're talking about, uh, for example, bail predictions or uh, the calculating the risk of um, recidivism, we can't predict the future. So we have to remember to take some of these uh, predictions with a grain of salt and really think in depth uh, about what the human approach uh, would be to to determining the next the next steps, not simply what a machine spits out. Yeah, and I think that's an interesting um, point in terms of techno deference. I remember when um, some of the solutions were newer about five years ago and very learned people who I will not name would be saying things like, well, it must be objective because the machine has told us that without any consciousness of the fact that obviously the machine was just repeating decisions made by humans who, as we all know, um, have all have different kinds of unconscious bias. So we've talked about um, lots of different challenges here about transparency um, and and fairness and, and techno-deference. Um, what's 
what are some of the issues where we do have existing laws and we look at how we're going to manage, I think you mentioned it in terms of um, facial recognition, say something like privacy versus um, accuracy or individual, individual privacy versus group safety. I mean, these are the kinds of dilemmas I think that people are discussing in terms of these tools. Is that something you want to comment on or are there other challenges that you think people should be aware of? Gosh, there's so, so many things I want to comment on there. <laughs> um, one thing that I wanted to mention in relation to the objectivity of tech is the example of Amazon, which uh, developed a, an algorithm to inform their hiring practices, in, particularly in technically uh, based roles. Now, they used historical data to find out who have they hired and who have been the best performers. Now, you might think that that's neutral data, but really, if you feed it into an algorithm, which is what they did, it turned out to preference male candidates. Now, that doesn't end up being an objective decision. That ends up being a biased decision. And it has a number of negative consequences, not only to discriminate against uh, potential uh, female and non-binary applicants, but also it disadvantages the organization from getting the best candidates that they could possibly hire. So when we're thinking about uh, implementing these algorithms into the organization, we really need to be thinking not only about um, how to explain the decisions internally, but also how we want to be accountable to the people that they impact. So uh, Amazon ultimately ended up deciding not to use this algorithm. This is something that they did proactively. Mm -hmm. However, if they had continued to use this algorithm, I would be asking whether it was in contradiction of anti-discrimination law. So again, yeah. this brings us back to the point of uh, existing laws do exist and they do apply. Before we develop any new types of laws, we need to make sure that we are appropriately compliant with the ones that do exist. That is a really fascinating example of, again, that positive um, benefits and harms you're avoiding when you actually work through the process of what you want the outcomes to be when you're employing the technologies and how much you want a human to be involved. I'm not sure if it's from that example, but I think it's from one of the legal examples where the point is, in fact, not to exclude those kinds of identifying factors like sex or age or race, but actually to ensure that they are captured so you can then test for um, a bias that's coming through in the in the predictions or decisions that the the organisation is making. Are there tools out there that you know if if um, someone listening today is thinking of employing one of these in their in their firm or advising one of their clients? on an outcome, how how can they go around understanding how those decisions were made and how those uh, how those how the choices for procurement were made as well? Absolutely. That's such a good question. And uh, again, this this reminds us as technology is part of the solution. There are a range of different tools that uh, can test for bias, can uh, audit different uh, AI systems. In t there's no one silver bullet approach to this uh, and it takes, it, it, it is disappointing, maybe one day, but it. T I think the most important thing to emphasize is that it's not just about the AI tool that you're using or the AI algorithm that you've implemented within your organization. You have to take a whole of system approach because your AI processes link in with humans, your customer service team, it might help uh, lawyers make decisions within their practice. It might also link in uh, with other systems that don't use AI. So when you're thinking about assessing your AI tool and looking at its impact, you need to look at it in a holistic way. How does it operate within your organisation? So in terms of that, I'd also be taking us back to the categories of harm. So looking at failure, looking at malicious use and looking at overuse and thinking about, all right, well, which harms are the most realistic ones? If you're using an AI system that is purely analytical, so for example, you're looking to predict your company's performance based on past performance, 
The real risk that you might be thinking about is economic. If you're uh, making decisions uh, about your resourcing and investment based on uh, that past data and the analysis that the AI tool generates, that won't necessarily have an immediate uh, adverse effect on individuals in the same way a discriminatory algorithm would that denied someone a service. So it's about really mapping out those harms, understanding what your system does, and then uh, really looking to interrogate and find assurance uh, mechanisms that are going to suit the, the system's needs. That probably leads us really well into how AI-based technologies are being used in legal practice. And, you know, full disclosure, obviously LexisNexis has produced some of those tools and why we're very grateful to, to continue to learn from experts. But what do you see changing as the tools evolve or even the introduction of generative AI for the legal profession particularly? So at the moment, one of the biggest skills that lawyers are needing to develop is identifying correct prompts if they're going to use a technology like generative AI and also to understand how these tools work and how to get the most out of them. So if you're asking for a research summary, how do you pose that question correctly? The other thing that is increasingly important is still having um, that engagement and that full understanding of the law so that you can sense check whether the AI produced outputs are in fact accurate. We're not at the stage where everything is coming out seamlessly as we discussed earlier. So we still need a lot of oversight from professionals in the field. Some of the things that I have been pondering is what what role does AI play in terms of either perpetuating or reducing inequality in the courtroom? So who might have access to some of these tools? Um, would a client consent to a lawyer using these AI tools? There's some really big questions about how we communicate about the tools that we use and thinking through um, that question of trust as well. So we know that some AI systems can make far better decisions, far more accurate decisions than humans can. We're fallible. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, in medical contexts, there are some systems that have much more accurate ca capabilities in terms of medical diagnosis. But in order to be able to use these systems in practice, we need to do a lot of work in terms of building trust with the public that's actually going to be impacted by these systems. So similarly, in the legal profession, we need to think about bringing people on the journey and making sure that we're doing it properly and minimising risk so that we don't see large-scale deployment of systems that are not functioning as they should be, uh, because that takes us back a lot of steps in terms of um, harnessing the benefits of AI. We want to make sure that we integrate it well. And what sort of things can people do to make sure that they do understand how the systems work, harms and benefits, especially, you know, our, our listeners out there might be looking at using um, AI for business development purposes or for providing legal advice, but what sort of things should they be looking out for and how do they get up to speed on this very fast changing and emerging area? Gosh, there are so many resources uh, that are out there. I think um, keeping up to date with the conversation is incredibly difficult because there are just new articles uh, coming out every single day. I think for me, uh, the most important thing is to start having conversations between different teams within the business. A lot of AI failures occur because there simply is that siloing that happens between, for example, an engineering department or a procurement department and then some of the people who are using the AI systems in customer service or in management or in analytics. So I think it's uh, bringing different skill sets, different domain experts into any conversation that you're having about procuring, developing, or deploying an AI system. 
Uh, the other thing that is crucially important as well is to think about when do you review your system? So if you might already have some AI systems in place and making sure that you're constantly asking those questions. Are you still getting the outcomes that you intended when you first implemented this system? And and also keeping up, I think, with legislative change as well. In Australia, we're about to see major privacy overhaul, and that's going to have implications, again, as we've discussed, whether you're using AI-based technologies or just generally as part of your compliance framework for your organisation. And um, since I've already plugged my own organisation, I will also say that, obviously, you run um, training sessions for lawyers as well to understand what these concepts might mean and how to advise clients in terms of whether they're deciding to procure deploy or develop AI. And I think that's a really great starting point to understand both the ethical dilemmas, the human rights dilemmas, as well as delivering responsible innovation that actually gets you to your business strategy. Because it's not really about what technology you use, it's making sure you get those positive outcomes. Now, this has been a fantastic conversation, Linda. Is there anything else you want to add that you think people um, might be interested in hearing about in terms of responsible AI or the ethical dilemmas they're, they're facing? Look, I think I would just conclude by saying that AI is a general purpose technology, meaning that we'll find it in every sector, in mm. pretty much every element of our lives. That's exciting, uh, but it also brings uh, some of the most interesting challenges uh, we have to really be prepared to ask the right questions because this is an emerging landscape. And as I said earlier, unfortunately, there's no silver bullet at the moment. If there was, I'd be out of a job. But uh, ultimately, we need to be prepared to ask the right questions when we are developing, deploying or procuring AI systems. And that is uh, really going to get us to better outcomes. Thank you so much, Linda. Again, we're we're trying to keep this to a certain time limit, but honestly, your your depth of experience and critical thinking on this on this this and many subjects is is so useful. So thank you so much for your time today, and um, we'll speak to you soon. Thank you.